technology does what it's supposed to do sometimes. <laughs> Friends, grace and peace to you this day. A peace and a grace that comes from Jesus, our Savior, and nowhere else. On October 31st, back in the year 1517, in Wittenberg, Germany, they call it Wittenberg in German, but we would read it Wittenberg, uh, where Martin Luther lived and taught theology, he nailed those 95 theses to the door at the castle church, and he challenged the Catholic Church for its sale of indulgences for the forgiveness of sin. And Luther's ideas, derived from scripture, advocated for a reliance on Christ over the reliance on priests. That was a big power shift in the Catholic Church, and it was resisted by the Church, which did everything it could do to shut Luther and other reformers down. Now, they were not called reformers at that time. They were called much, much worse. Their threat to the power of the Catholic Church was immense. Their advocacy for a faith that was reliant on Jesus Christ, his own acts to accomplish our salvation and nothing else, well, it made them a very dangerous threat to those in power of a corrupt church. And one of the tools that reformers like Martin Luther used was the newly developed printing press. Gutenberg had just developed the press and it was being widely used at this time. And another tool that the reformers used was music, music. On music, Luther said this, if any despises music as all fanatics do, <laughs> for them I have no liking. For music is a gift and grace of God, not an invention of humans. Thus it drives the devil and makes people cheerful. He also said, the devil, the originator of sorrowful anxieties and restless troubles, flees before the sound of music almost as much as before the word of God. Luther went on to say, that he would allow no one to teach or preach God's people without a proper knowledge of the use and power of sacred song. In fact, many of history's most beloved hymns, the hymns that we still sing often in today's church, many of those hymns come from the time soon after Luther's time, those early years of the Reformed Church. And Luther took to writing his own hymns hymns that congregation uh, took joy in singing, hymns that broke the concept of needing a middle person to commune with God. So as people could pray and seek God's, God's personal uh, presence in their lives, pray on their own for themselves, they could also sing praise without a priest needing to lift those words. And a mighty fortress is our God, was one of several hymns that Luther himself wrote. At least the words are his. There is some debate whether the melody is his alone. Luther wrote that beloved hymn to convey the message of the gospel, of assurance to a people and a church filled with dread. God's wrath was one fear preached by priests in the Mass, preached often to sell indulgence, to seek peoples, uh, to exploit the dread around one's sin. And in addition to that, the plague was claiming people's lives all around. People were dying at rates much, much higher even than our recent COVID pandemic. Anyone could contract the plague. There was no cure for it, and it meant almost certain death. With death comes instability, as kings and armies fall prey to the plague and to each other. Uncertainty and fear reigned in the lives of most during those times, even the most devout believer. 
The church was not a comfort. It was exploiting people's fears for the sake of selling indulgence, of using their power. So Luther turned to Psalm 46 and essentially rewrote parts of that psalm as a Christian message of hope and assurance. The psalm begins, God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And the psalm contains the refrain, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Our mighty fortress, in Luther's words. A fortress provided safety and protection to towns and cities from attacking forces. And the hymn conveys the idea of a fortress uh, uh, defending believers against the attacks of the devil and of all evil, of being a safe place for the church. Just as a fortress shields the city from harm and prevails against siege, God provides an unfailing refuge for God's children amid life's hardships and life's trials. The hymn became, as one historian named Louis Benson said, the Marseillaise of the Revolution, the battle hymn. It was sung at the Augsburg Diet, where the Book of Concord was compiled. It was sung in all the churches of Saxony, and it was often used as a protest song against the priests. It was a rebel's song in many ways. It was sung in streets and so heard, it comforted the hearts of people like Melanchthon and Jonas and Krusiger as they entered Weimar when they were banished from Wittenberg in 1547. It was sung by poor Protestant emigrants on their way into exile as they were kicked out of their communities. It was sung by martyrs at their death, sometimes by being burned at a stake. And it's woven into the history of the Reformation. And it has become even a true national hymn of Protestant Germany. I want to share with you an early translation uh, from the German to English. And it read like this. Our God is a defense and tower, a good armor and a good weapon. He has been ever our help and our succor. In all the troubles that we've been in, therefore we will never dread. For any wondrous deed by water or by the land, in the hills or the seaside, our God has them all in his hand. Please join with me in singing verses 1 through 3 of A Mighty Fortress. It is on page 4, I'm sorry, 504 in your hymnals. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. A mighty fortress is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation for us. Behold, satanic foe, has sworn to work us woe with craft and dreadful might he arms himself to fight on earth he has no equal no strength of ours can match his might we would be lost, rejected. But now a champion comes to fight, whom God himself elected. 
you ask who this may be the lord of hosts is he christ jesus mighty lord god's only son adored he holds the field victorious though hordes of devils fill the land all threatening to devour us we tremble not unmoved we stand they cannot overpower us let this world's tyrant rage in battle we'll engage his might is doomed to fail god's judgments must prevail one little word subdues him luther wrote those words for his time but I think it could have just as well been written for our time. Hordes of devils ruling the land, powers in battle, ruling tyrants exercising their powers over others, dangers. If he were alive today, he might have added a verse about climate disaster, about what we're seeing around us. In recent days, a hurricane struck Acapulco. It was unusual because it grew from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane in less than nine hours. There was no warning, no evacuation, no way to protect property or the lives of the vulnerable in that short time. There was a panic. Typically, it takes days for that type of development in a storm and in all these things there is only one place to turn for assurance and for comfort one person to turn to Jesus Jesus God's Word the living Christ is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble Jesus the Word of God in the flesh the one who died to save us all from the powers of sin, death, and the devil. No power can overcome Jesus, not even death, not pandemic, not climate disaster, not even war, nothing. And then there was Wednesday night a week ago. For hours and hours on that Wednesday night, a woman named Jessica Karcher waited at the Central Maine Medical Center in Lewiston, Maine, for news about her son. His name is Justin. All she knew was that he had been at Schmeggie's bar and that he was somewhere in the hospital, maybe just feet away from her. She told the New York Times, it's hours, it's days and minutes. Everything just slows right down. At about 2 a.m. on Thursday morning, she learned that her son had been shot four times, that he was in critical condition, and he was on a breathing ventilator, sedated. She said, first, it was, is he alive or is he dead? She was standing vigil in the hospital parking lot for much of that night. Now, she said, the next day, it's only this. I want to know, is he going to make it? That morning, that Wednesday morning, before the shooting, Justin had signed a contract to buy a house. It was his first house. At 23, his mother was quite proud of him. And then, she said, he headed to Schmeggie's for a weekly pool tournament, just one of his many hobbies. He's a very outgoing person, she said. Everybody loves him. He's just a people person. On Thursday morning, Jessica finally got to see her son, and it gutted her. Her tall, 
young, healthy son lay under a blue hospital gown awaiting surgery. It doesn't feel true, she told the newspaper, even though I've seen him. It's scary not knowing. He just doesn't even look like himself. Please join in singing the last verse of A Mighty Fortress, verse number four. God's word forever shall abide. No thanks to those who fear it. For God himself fights by our side with weapons of the Spirit. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wretched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you to follow along in your bulletin as we engage in our litany of remembrance this All Saints Sunday. O risen Christ, today we remember with fondness all your saints who have been called to their eternal home, especially those from our church community who have died during this past year. James Thomas, Mary Ellen Dunerman, Irene Haberman, Catherine Spengler, Charles Spengler, Doug Clare, Ellen Hoffman, Doc Simpson, Delinda Gray, Virginia Pedaliski, Paul Leary, Ed Ross. Diane Pound, and others we name before you, aloud or in our hearts. There are those who we continue to miss, although more than a year has passed since they were with us. We name them before you now, silently or aloud. Aletha, Peter, At the rising of the sun and at its going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and the chill of the winter, we remember them. 
At the opening of the buds and the rebirth of spring, we remember them. At the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of the summer, we remember them. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. During the holiday occasions and at the year's end, we remember them. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are now part of us as we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick in heart, we remember them. When we have joy we want to share, we remember them. Amen. I invite you to stand for our hymn of praise. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of For All the Saints. the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed. Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thou wast their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. The good, the darkness drear their one true light. Alleluia, Alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson today is from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. 
and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 34 responsively. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the lowly hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. The lions are in want and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. O oh Lord, you redeem the life of your servants, and those who put their trust in you will not be punished. Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have put this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after his disciples sat down, he came to them. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This past Friday, the family of Ellen Hoffman said goodbye to her right here. They blessed her on her heavenly way, and they grieved her death with sweet memories, and some memories that hurt, they were so sweet. Her children sat in the sanctuary here, some in the front rows right before me, and, and a little further back were other family, relatives, friends, even many of you, her church friends, 
her sister, who sat over behind the piano uh, with, with her walker in front of her, Ellen's sister of nearly a hundred years. And all the while, Ellen's body lay in front of us in the white casket, and flowers that you see now were on each side. And I stood there, much like I am today, before everybody. And in the balcony were the same people that are up there now, an organist carefully finding notes with her fingers and her feet, because you got to use your fingers and your feet with that organ. Another musician, Glenn, breathed air into his trumpet, and he used his fingers to adjust how much air went through the instrument to make the notes fit. And then another musician bent his chin to his left shoulder, uh, moving and holding the violin, moving the bow and the strings to make the notes fit. Somehow he held that and pulled it in just the right way to make it weep at one moment and then shout with joy the next. And all around us was the smell of perfume. Maybe you still smelled that this morning when you came to church because Ellen's family asked that her favorite perfume be sprayed around the sanctuary. All of us gathered together, and it was beautiful in many ways. Care was taken to make it beautiful. Planning and arrangements were in place for Ellen's funeral. But I wonder what it might look like to an outsider, to someone who had never been to such a service before. Maybe someone there Friday was attending their first funeral. If someone just walked in off the street, found a seat, what might they think about what was happening Friday? Confusion, maybe. Profound sadness and loss was met with words of hope. Profound grief and tears met with sounds of good cheer. Palpable tears matched with calls for rejoicing. Was this a goodbye or was it a welcome home? Gathered beside a dead body, people spoke and sang about life. They talked about Ellen in her casket. They spoke about another person named Jesus. Jesus and resurrection. They talked about those a lot. Jesus in sacred story, Jesus in song. Resurrection in sacred story and resurrection in song. In prayer, too, people spoke of Jesus and of resurrection. And I wonder if a stranger had come to worship, if someone with no religious background had come with no context in which to hear the good news of Christ's resurrection to new life, I wonder if they would be amazed, amazed at what was happening. I surely hope so. And I also hope that every eye and every ear and maybe even every nose that was present at Ellen's funeral experienced that amazement too. I hope that all who were here received something precious and sacred, something that is truly amazing. Life and resurrection when death is so close. And I hope that happens every time that God's people gather like we are today. I hope it happens every time we gather to talk about Jesus and resurrection. When we sing about Jesus in song and hear about Jesus in sacred story, and when we share resurrection in song and resurrection in story, I hope we feel amazed at what we're saying, the words coming from our mouths and sung around us. I hope that that happens every time. Every time we gather, we gather around Jesus and we gather around resurrection. Two amazing things, Jesus and resurrection. Two especially amazing things at a funeral of all times and places. Two 
especially amazing things whenever we need to be amazed. Amazing things whenever we need to be reminded of why Jesus and resurrection matter so much. Those things are what we are all about. Jesus and resurrection. We don't gather every week to socialize and we're not necessarily here to cheer for the home team. We're not about fashion. We're not about entertainment and flash. We're not about parading our wealth or about exploiting poverty. We're not about whitewashing history and we're not about making fake stories. We're not about false hope at all. We're not about a Hallmark greeting card that plays on our emotions. We gather and we are all about the real life. The real life that we share together. Life with all its mix of pleasure and pain, of joys and sadness, love and anger and, yes, death, and resurrection. Jesus and resurrection matter. That's what we are all about. Today we remember the saints, the loved ones, the people who we've known who have died and who live in the resurrection of Jesus. Today we grieve, but we never grieve as people without a hope. And we have hope today because of Jesus and because of resurrection. The world crashes around us. It kills us. It cries out. It hurts us and it dies. And into that world, the body of Christ cries back. The body of Christ, the church, cries back, Jesus and resurrection. And we cry it. We shout it. We sing it. We pray it. We hear it. We did so at Ellen's funeral. And we do it right now. Every Sunday is about Jesus and resurrection. And that is truly amazing. That is truly amazing. Every single time it happens, every place it happens, it is truly amazing. We'll sing together verses 3 and 4 of For All the Saints. You can turn back in your bulletins and find verses 3 and 4. Bless communion, fellowship divine. We freely struggle, they in glory shine. Yet all are one, in thee for all are thine. Alleluia. Alleluia. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long seals on the ear the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Alleluia, Alleluia. 